I'm Amy, sex educator, somatic sex and relationship coach, and sex shop owner. And I'm April, VP of an international high-end pleasure products company and boss queen sex toy mogul. We're best friends who make our own rules about who we are as sexual beings. With everything from how to be a badass in the bedroom to top tips for bringing your relationship to the next level, we have something just for you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com. Hello, everyone. Amy here. No April this week. I uh, had the pleasure of recording a very uh, last minute episode with the wonderful Rain de Grey. Um, so you are in for a treat in this episode. If you don't know Rain, you'll hear more about her in our the, our bio uh, when the the interview begins. Um, but I've known Rain for a number of years, probably over 10 years. Um, Rain is a um, porn star performer specializing mostly in the kink community, but also a brilliant human being, an educator, an author, um, now a podcaster, and she's a total sex nerd. And so it's such a pleasure to have someone who has such a... Um, a dynamic perspective on sexuality and so well informed and educated. So um, this episode will be primarily about kink, but we go into um, some stuff about fetish. We go into um, some really taboo topics in the fetish world that most people don't want to talk about. Um, but I like asking provocative questions about specific fetishes because I think it speaks to the diversity that is humanity and um, their interests and preferences and how some of them really are so innate and built into us and we can't necessarily change. And yet um, oftentimes is. Um, really looked down upon in society. So um, really wanted to bring some light to that. And also we talk about um, the porn industry and how it's changed. And um, Rain has some very specific um, opinions very on on that. And so it's a really, really juicy episode that I love. If you're into total sex nerd, sex geek world, um, you will be in for a treat. So before we dive into that, though... Um, I would just want to, I'm mean, going to actually answer a sex question that is also related to the kink world too. Um, and uh, let's see, we'll start with that. So this sex question uh, is, we'll keep this person anonymous. Uh, the sex question asks, do you have podcasts explaining how one partner, a male, who's into heterosex and is in a partnership with a female who is into kink, what do they do? Um, there's the guy, a friend, um, and maybe this is true, really a friend. They've been uh, having trouble s enjoying striking their female partner and making her submissive. Um, the, I know the language is a little odd, but it, what I'm gauging from this question is that um, there is the male partner is into is more vanilla and the female partner is more into kink and she is asking for spanking. So that's the striking or some sort of striking or smacking uh, or consensual hitting. Um, and she is also into being submissive and is probably asking him to be in a dominant role. And this is really challenging for him or he's not finding enjoyment in it. Um, and this is common in terms of sexual interest and sexual preference of um, people having different desires. In fact, very rarely, I think, do two people come together and have the perfect amount of desire that will perfectly meet each other, right? So, like, whether it's just sexual desire in terms of how much sex you want to have, um, often it's most likely very different for two different people or somewhat different or different one day of the week and then the other day of the week it matches. Um, and same thing with interests. You know, one person's into one thing and the other person's not. So, relationships... As we've said in a lot of past episodes, they're always a negotiation. It's a ne constant negotiation, a constant dance of figuring out what works best together. Um, or maybe it's just not, maybe it's not two people, maybe it's three or four of you. Um, and it's constant. It's not just that you sit down and have one conversation about what kind of sex you like and then you move forward and it's all 
um, all easy from there. It's you have these constant check-ins and conversations about uh, what we want and what we don't want, what's working, what's not working. Uh, I can honestly say for myself that I am guilty of not always doing these check-ins and um, and just kind of getting caught up in life. And then something will happen where now my partner and I have to have this check-in, but it's uh, coming in this like almost explosive or... Um, yeah, this this kind of last resort way that is not as smooth as it would be if we were doing regular check-ins. So one way to remedy that is if you're in a long-term partnership is to have regular check-ins once a month. Sit down, like how's our sex life? And start with what's working. Like what's working really well? What feels really good? What are we loving? What are we enjoying? And then start with what do we want more of? You know, what, what are we feeling like we desire that's uh, not, there's not as much of it here as we'd like? A scary conversation because it can bring up a lot and um, and can be kind of oh I don't know can can highlight some of the the scary stuff the shadows and um, at the same time some really beautiful stuff can come from it. So in this case, for these two people who have different interests, it's all about finding the middle ground. So you negotiate. Hey, I'm I'm more of a vanilla human. I'm more into. Um, I don't know what that is. I mean, if there's, it's that can mean so many things. But I'm more into, say, um, you know, missionary penetrative sex, and um, I am into being really connected with my partner, really intimate, and um, spanking kind of scares me. And the other partner says, "Cool, well, spanking is really hot to me, and when spanking is on the table." Um, and is something that we share together, I get really turned on. And so they have to figure out how to work together in this. Um, and as I say, they have to. It's They don't have to do anything. This is an option. You have a choice to figure out what works for you. And if one person's really getting a huge no, like I'm not, I'm not willing to spank. It freaks me out. I'll be really uncomfortable. Like I have some stuff around that where it's just, I'm not even willing to learn how to um, embrace that as part of me. Then they need to honor their no. And maybe um, either they find other outlets, like uh, maybe they open their relationship up and one partner can get spanking elsewhere. And you know, that can happen where they get spanked in other environments, but then they don't have sex with those other people. You know, that spanking becomes something that they share with um, friends or cuddle buddies or in when they go to sex dungeons and, you know, in San Francisco together or sex parties, but they still only have penetrative sex with or all other sex with their primary partner. So there's ways to remedy that or or they break up. You know, maybe this is a really important part of this person's life is is embracing their kink. And if they're not with a partner that can embrace it, then it's not going to work out. So there's there's options. It's all a choice. But if they're choosing to work together, um, then they and to stay together and not break up, then they find what works best for both of them. And that could look like the more vanilla person really starting to learn more about these things, about spanking or striking or dominance and submission, um, learning, like reading up on it, listening to podcasts, watching videos, taking courses, sex ed courses, um, and you can do those online. They don't have to all be in person because I know not everyone lives in a progressive city like Santa Cruz. Um, but, and you can go to we, Pure Pleasure. We have a lot of online workshops, not necessarily about how to be kinky, but there's one on intermediate rope bondage and we have another one on uh, basic rope bondage coming out actually with Rain DeGray, who's in this episode. Um, but if you go to purepleasureshop.com, you can look up the online classes. Um, anyways, so they learn more about it and then they start to just experiment and see what feels good and what doesn't feel good. And they out the awkward and they out the uncomfortable, meaning when stuff comes up, you know, maybe they try to do something, they try to take on the dominant role and it's feeling really uncomfortable instead of pretending like they got it all together. They talk about it and they own it and they share with their partner what it brought up for them. And that really takes a lot of weight off the shoulders. If you're not putting on a show, like I got this all figured out and they work together along the way to see what feels good for both of them and find the middle ground. You know, maybe they discover that spanking doesn't work, but um, you know, very light 
chin sh- chin holding or patting on the on the butt or on other parts of the body that are spank friendly work. Um, again, there's so many options on the table, and if we the more we learn, the more we realize that there's endless options on the menu on how we can work together and what we can add and expand and create our own rules for what sexuality looks like. So, um, yeah, I don't think I'll go too much, too much deep. I, I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I feel, I feel like that's already a lot of information there. Um, but honestly, knowledge is power. And the more we learn and the more we experiment and understand what we like and don't like, and the more we communicate about it along the way, um, and the more we open ourselves up to not thinking we have it all figured out, you know, like I'm a vanilla person. That's just how I am. Um, maybe that's true if you've tried all the things, <laughs> but pro- you probably haven't. Most people haven't tried all the things to know exactly who they are. Um, and it, it, again, sometimes it doesn't take trying all the things. It takes mentally trying on to understand if something works for us. And you get to decide what's for you and what's not for you. And there's nothing, there's no hierarchy of sexuality, meaning no one is better based on being more open or more into kink or less into kink or whatever that is. You know, it's everyone gets their own rules and gets to um, design their erotic landscape as it pertains to them. So I will leave that that sex question at that. Uh, before we start the episode, on another note, we've talked about this in past podcasts and we're going to keep talking about it because uh, April and I are huge, huge, huge fans of this. And um, we'll I'll keep it brief because in the past we've talked about it for like m- multiple minutes. And um, and so if you want more information, if you listen to our last episode or two, you can get more information on this or you can just go directly to omgs.com. In fact, if you do omgs.com backslash shameless, you get $5 off of this wonderful online educational program that is teaching people all the wonderful things on the menu for sexual pleasure. And it's through uh, online videos. Um, A lot of some of them are actually interactive. And it's wonderful if you want to learn new tools and new skills. Like even if you think you already know how to touch your body, and this is the season one is specifically to female body folks. Um, This can just up your pleasure game and learn all these new techniques. I know I've watched it and I had no idea of these different techniques that I can do on my body that my, that I didn't even know my body liked. Um, And so, yeah, season one is just external pleasure. And when you go online and you buy season one, it's a one-time fee. It's not a subscription and you own it. And there's 62 videos and 11 interactive modules packed with information. And they're actually about to launch season two, which is internal stimulation for female bodies. Um, also great if you want to learn how to pleasure female bodies, whether you have a female body or you love female bodied folks, this can teach you some tools um, because we are visual people. Videos are very, very helpful and reading can be really challenging. So highly recommend it. Go to OMG. Yes. Like, oh my God, OMG. Yes.com backslash shameless um, and go and learn some things. And it's super affordable. And I um, am pretty sure you will not regret we're good at uh, and one other piece before diving into the podcast, we talked about this in our last one as well. April and I, when we go to sex toy trade shows, we go to them once every couple of months. Um, and we work for our companies. You know, I work for Uber Lube. She works for Hot Octopus. Awesome, awesome companies. Um, you've heard us talk about in the past. I think Uber Lube's the best lube ever. Um, and Hot Octopus makes some really awesome male masturbation toys. Uh, and we're always looking around at what's new on the market. Like that's what we do. We'd look at what's new. And I also look for what's new because, um, uh, I bring the information back to my mom at pure pleasure and then she carries those products. And one of our favorite new things that we saw is the horoscope line from Bijou Indiscrets. And it's, a uh, really awesome silicone finger vibrator, but it's in a kit and it comes with this little gem necklace that's based on your sign, your horoscope sign. Uh, and then also a little little uh, tingle bomb for your for your clitoris or for your genitals. You can also put those on penises too. Um, but there, I think there's earth, air, wind, and fire, and some of them are warming, and some of them are tingling, and it just really pertains to your sign. And it's super cute. It's a great gift for yourself. It's under 50 bucks, or a gift for someone else. We have the holidays coming up but I think it's absolutely adorable you get a sex toy and jewelry and clitoral bomb um, or stimulating bomb all in one for under 50 bucks and it's 
adorable. So um, this was one of the things that we saw at the trade show. We're really like we're super excited about it. So if you go to bijouindiscrets.com, that's B-I-J-O-U-X-I-N-D-I s c r e t s dot com and you use code shameless in all caps you get 15 percent off as well those are my little shout outs um to start with i'll have some more at the end of the podcast too because we are very particular about what we like as we've said in past podcasts um i've been we've both been in the sex toy industry for over 10 years uh, and as sex educators we're super picky about who we what about the products we use on our own bodies? So anything that we talk about are only things that we actually love, have tried, and will vouch for. So you can um, rely on that, that we are not just sending you a whole bunch of bullshit. <laughs> One last shout out before beginning the podcast. Uh, if you are in the Santa Cruz area, I'm teaching a Tantra in Motion workshop. It's a central movement workshop, a combination of Tantra and and contact improv dance alongside the wonderful Daniel Molner, who is a phenomenal teacher. He has a master's degree in education and um, runs Ecstatic Dance Santa Cruz here in Santa Cruz. Uh, it is on November 4th. This is 2018. It's from 1 to 5 p.m. So it's a half day workshop and it is going to be f- full of all kinds of um, yummy experiential sacred sexuality um, and contact improv work and it is open to individuals couples um, anyone and everyone and all touch will be consensual over the clothes it's a really great way to get into your bodies um, if you're feeling kind of disconnected from your bodies or like wanting to ramp up some desire this is an, a really great way to do it it's an experiential practice right so that's the most effective so uh, this is going to be, you sign up through purepleasureshop.com and it, the class is actually going to be held at Body and Soul um, downtown. So find out more at purepleasureshop.com. Again, November 4th, it's Tantra in Motion. Okay, so let's dive into the podcast with the wonderful Rain de Grey. Um, and I just want to give a little warning here that. Um, there might be one moment that is kind of triggering for folks because I ask a question about pedophilia, um, not praising it in any way, but highlighting the challenges around this um, this extreme fetish that is n- obviously for for just reasons not um, I guess socially acceptable. But I also don't think that we are working with people with pedophilia in a helpful way. We're instead like ostracizing them. So we're not condoning it in any way. We only condone condone consensual sex um, and specifically between consenting adults. Um, And this, that is something that we do bring up in, in this podcast. So just want to put a little like trigger warning out there. um, If that's something that is going to be kind of triggering or scary for you, so you can know ahead of time in case you want to not listen or tune that out. Um, and I think that Rain has some really great and valuable perspectives on it that um, that makes it more of an educational experience. So um, just a little trigger warning for you, just in case, because I care about each and every one of your hearts. So with that, enjoy the episode. All right, everyone, it is podcast time. Well, you're on the podcast episode time. And as promised, we have the wonderful Rain de Grey with us. And now I normally read the bios, but Rain, you're so well-spoken. Can you just tell our listeners who you are, what you do? You do so many things. Of course. Hi, everyone. My name is Rain DeGray. I am an author, an educator, an activist, and I have my own podcast, Dirty Talk with Rain DeGray. I do a bi-monthly advice column, Dirty Talk with Rain DeGray, sensing a theme. It's called branding. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, have lectured all over the world. I actually got asked to present at Harvard for Sex Week. I have been teaching classes for the past decade. I can be found as Rain to Gray on FetLife, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and raintogray.com. If anyone's listening to this episode and they have questions they'd like to submit to the advice column, go to my website. My email is rain at rain to gray. I would love to talk to you, hear your thoughts, and possibly have you featured in an upcoming 
advice column or podcast. Ooh. I have a Google voice as well. So sometimes people will uh, contact and come in and they will call the Google voice and think that I will pick up on the <laughs> other line. And I hate to disappoint you, but I will not pick up. However, you can leave a message and that Google voice number is 614-733-4739, otherwise known as R. DeGray. Ah, smart. 614 R. DeGray. I'm, I'm trying to make myself easy to find. <laughs> On the internet, not in person. Yes. You can't find me in person. Uh, but on the internet, I should be easy to find. You're pretty easy to find. And I noticed in your whole your whole um, description of what you do, you didn't say performer. Are you not performing anymore? Are you not doing videos in the porn industry anymore? I'm doing significantly less. Okay. And I, I, I'm actually glad that you asked. I have a lot of mixed feelings about it. This is something that um, saddens me to a great degree. What has happened is that piracy has gutted an industry that I hold dear. And it's not just porn, but it's movie, music, television, stand-up comedy. Uh, we have raised a, an entitled generation of people that believe that entertainment comes for free in the magic box on their desk. Mm -hmm. And kink.com doesn't own the armory anymore. It became more profitable to rent out the armory for office space than to shoot porn in it. Wow, you, I did not you, know that. Wow. Oh yeah, hmm. it's it's uh, piracy is dying. Uh, piracy is killing the internet, and nobody wants to pay. I get people all the time that say, "I am your biggest fan," and I, my standard response is, "Great, that's amazing. What sites are you a member of? I'd love to shoot you a message." I have, and that's all you say. And they, they will not come, they will be either, they'll be incredibly indignant and throw all their toys out the pram. How dare you accuse me of being a thief? People will come up to me, they will send me direct links to Pornhub, which is a pirate site, mm -hmm. and say, why can't I find more videos? It's like, you're asking me to do the homework to find more stolen content for you to watch mm -hmm. for free. I have a, an OnlyFans profile, OnlyFans Rain de Grey, and I do custom content. I do videos, and it's a way that I can monitor it where my content's not being stolen. But every company I've shot for either is out of business or is a shadow of their former selves. Um, piracy. Piracy is killing it. So I am still a performer. I still do occasional things. I post every day on my OnlyFans because it's something that I can control. I am grateful I got in the industry when I did. I had amazing experiences. I know that if I was trying to get in now, it's not like it was. And piracy is, has, has killed it. And what people aren't realizing is the immediate gratification. Why should I have to pay for porn? Porn is free. I get told that on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you say, you should pay me for the work I'm creating, the, the videographer, the makeup artist, the location, the electricity to, to keep lights in the building, you got to hire the model, you have to pay for tests. None of that comes out of a void. And people feel so comfortable with stealing that they would be indignant at the idea of having to pay for something. Content's free. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, that's where I'm at and I'm, I'm, I don't shoot nearly as much as I used to and it's, I'm, I'm sad about it, uh, but no one has figured a solution and it's, it's not just happening with porn, it's happening in Hollywood too. Movies are getting leaked onto, uh, albums are getting leaked before they're even released. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you turn there, it, it, it's the entitlement culture of I should get entertainment for free. Yeah, that yeah, I did I like that you put that with the entitlement culture and um yeah, I mean you're as a performer, this is that was is a career and so yeah, you as a career it's your livelihood and so of course you should get paid for what you do and um yeah, the internet has definitely changed things. So when did you get into that part of the industry when it was good? You know, when you started doing uh, porn as a performer and it was still lucrative and made sense? Uh, I got in in the tail end. Honestly, the piracy thing has been spiraling and it's been getting worse and worse. I first got in mm, 
11 years ago. Mm-hmm. And even 11 years ago, you could start to see the writing on the wall. Uh, the good old days had already passed 11 years ago, but they, it wasn't like it is now. It's a scraped shell. Mm-hmm. I knew that I was coming in on the tail end, and I'm not a dumb person. I'm, I'm pretty aware of my environment and my surroundings and what's happening. I was never one of those performers who was partying all night and going to clubs and buying $500 shoes. I made enough money that I could have bought $500 shoes. I bought a house instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just worked as hard as I possibly could. And one of the limitations I was working around is the fact that I'm not necessarily heavily tattooed, but I have a tattoo of a morning glory that goes from my ankle to my armpit on my right side. So there was less work available for me than if I didn't have that much ink work. And I didn't have enough ink work to qualify as one of the inked girls head to toe. I didn't have full sleeve work or anything like that. And vanilla porn never appealed to me. I I'm old fashioned. I'm a bit of a romantic. I, want to know what your favorite food is, what your favorite color is, you know, what's your favorite band before I fuck you. And I did BDSM fetish porn. There was much more of a sense of family and community in it. And I had friends that made the transition and went down to LA and did, you know, regular vanilla boy girl work. And that wasn't where my passion lay. You'd mentioned with being a performer, uh, wanting to get paid. I loved everything that I did. And I would be perfectly willing to do it for free. And that was actually always the motto that I had was I would never take a shoot that I wasn't willing to do for free. And I would turn down work if it wasn't the right fit for me. And going down to LA and not even getting a chance to know someone and hopping on their dick didn't get me excited. So I didn't uh, explore that aspect of the industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the good old days, um, I was good friends with Mark Davis. He's retired now, but he was talking back in the day. He was doing two shoots a day. I, he back to back, you know, you could, you could do that. And the work just slowly, incrementally month after month, year after year reduced. The makeup artists would be saying, you know, back in the day they would be doing five, six, seven faces. Uh, that's what they call, they do a face and, because that's how much filming was happening. And it was getting down to the point where they were doing two a day, one a day. So it wasn't just that the piracy was affecting porn performers, but it's a whole circle around that. Uh, Gaffers, PA people, wardrobe, makeup artists, caterers. There's when the, the piracy, you're thinking I'm taking the content and it's not having any effects. It's actually spilling out and affecting prop builders. Kink had... 150 employees, metal workers, leather workers, you know, costuming, set designers, all of those people are unemployed now because of piracy. Mm. So in, in kink is still, they just, they downsized. They're still functioning, but they're just not in the armory and they're not, not, I don't, there's not a huge business anymore. Well, so what they've done is they've turned to each director and, um, it, Porn directing, vanilla porn directing is one thing, but BDSM porn directing usually involves rope. Mm. And the people that do it, the the directors that can also do rope work are called riggers. And it is an incredibly specialized talent. And I always compare being a rigger. These people, they're, they're artists with rope. Mm-hmm. But I, I compare it to being the world's best grape peeler. It doesn't matter how well you can peel a grape where are you going to go? That's a very specific set of skills. So what Kink said to the directors is, hey, the armory is shut down. If you can hire people, hire models, get the testing figured out, come up with wardrobe, find a location, videotape something, edit it, have proper lighting, come up with a script and give us a finished product, we'll sell it on our platform under kink.com. Hmm. And how, how many people are actually doing that? Is that it? Uh, James Mogul um, is still doing it. Ariel X, I believe, is still doing it. John Paul the Pope is still doing it. So now the burden is completely on the artistic person to 
cover out of their own pocket. They've got to do the budgeting. They have to come up with a location. They have to hire the models. They have to hire the production crew. They have to get the video cameras. They have to cover their own lighting. They have to come up with a script. They have to make the entire shoot happen. They have to edit it. And then they give it over to Kink, and Kink sells it under the umbrella of Kink.com. Mm. So Kink is not doing any labor. Okay. They're just they're providing the platform, and you can sell it under the Kink.com brand name. Okay. And these these people, all the directors that I mentioned, they've been directing in the industry for a decade, 15 years. Once you're in the industry, it's really hard to leave. Where are you going to go? What have you been doing for the past 15 years? Oh, I've been editing and directing hardcore BDSM porn Mm -hmm. or even regular porn. Once you decide to enter the industry, it's very hard to exit it because there's a huge, you either explain the gap in your resume. (laughs) When people were trying to leave kink, I know one of the, uh, 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 COOs was saying that he looked for a job for a year and a half and people would call him and come and, and bring him in for a job interview with no intent of ever actually hiring him, they just wanted to talk to and see someone who'd worked for kink.com. Mm, oh, because it was on his resume, and so they thought it was, it was fascinating, but they were like, yeah. oh, we're not going to hire someone who worked for kink.com. Right. We mm. just want to waste your time, have you come in and do a, a pseudo interview for a spot we're never going to give you, but it's exciting for us because we just get to set our eyeballs on someone who's worked for kink. So mm. your options are either to have it on your resume and then no one wants to hire you or to lie and do septrifuge. And the longer you've worked in the industry, the bigger the gap is. Mm-hmm. So how do you explain that gap? Uh, again, I can see the writing on the wall. I was modeling, but I made very, very sure that I was also always a production assistant and a photographer and a grip and a talent booker. And I did wardrobe and I did chauffeuring. So I always had something else I could put on my resume because you don't want to say, what have you been doing for the past decade? Dick. I've been doing dick. (laughs) That's that's hard to, um, I've actually written a book about getting into the modeling industry and it's being released as an ebook. One of the closing chapters is that's the advice I give is have something else. Mm -hmm. Don't have, I've been doing porn and nothing else for two, three, four, five years, because that's a really hard transition to make out. And what happens is that people then get stuck. And when they're emotionally ready to retire and they're burnt out and putting on jazz hands and sexy time is not where their heart is, there isn't any other jobs for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I so I met you uh, 10 years ago or so. You taught a rope bondage class at Pure Pleasure, and I love your workshops there. Um, There is a lot of the listeners know the way that I teach is um, more like playful and informative, but yours are very much like you have a live hot demo going on and people are practicing rope in class and sometimes you're tying big, beautiful cocks up with rope and <laughs> <laughs> all kinds of uh, entertaining yeah, and educational things. So your portfolio has been diversified for a while. You were not just a performer and now you're saying you also were you know, chauffeur and did all these other things, but you've been teaching for, and obviously, uh, people are hearing you right now. You're very articulate. I, you're a total sex nerd, um, and I love that about you. But so you, the t- you've the teaching piece is also, I think, is really important to you. Yes, you're really passionate about educating folks. Oh, yeah, I have a boner for knowledge. <laughs> I was homeschooled, and I never really went through the typical med- education system. And one of the things with homeschooling is that you really get to be your own tutor. And I love knowledge. I love it. I want to learn something new every day. And I don't, I I try not to close my eyes and go to bed without having picked up something new every single day. And from a very young age, there were not a, a lot of fellow children with me, I kind of homeschooled and spent a lot of time reading. And for me, it's not just that I want to acquire the knowledge, I want to share the knowledge. So I love learning new things. And then once I've learned the new things, I want to share the new things with everyone around me. So education was something, like you said, sex nerd. I've really been focusing on sex really strongly for the past decade. And they, uh, what's that line? do something for 10,000 hours and you become an expert. Mm. 
I started teaching classes really quickly after becoming kinky. I'm, I have fairly significant social anxiety. I'm on the spectrum. I'm very introverted. And one of the few places that I feel comfortable other than in my bedroom, in my pajamas, in bed with my cat and the internet is on stage. Mm. I'm really comfortable uh, being in control. And being on stage, uh, educating, teaching a class is an area where I'm in control. And for me, the hard part was the breaks. I'm on stage, I'm golden. You can put me in front of an audience of 10,000 people and I'm not going to break a sweat. I feel really comfortable. But put me in the crowd of 10,000 people and try to make small talk or people are jostling me and I- I'm miserable. I melt down. I have anxiety. I actually had gone out to New York a few months back to shoot an Infernal Restraints for insects. And because I'm a frugal person, um, the way that insects, they're in upstate New York, and they you take a bus to Port Authority. And from Port Authority, you then you have to take a cab to JFK. And the cab would have probably been, after tip, around $100. So I said to myself, self, what can I do to save money? and not pay $100 for a cab to get to the airport, I'll take the New York subway. How hard could that be? (laughs) I have never been so miserable in my life. I had panic sweat. Mm. I'm a Virgo with OCD, so I don't like to touch things. So I I didn't realize I was getting in a subway car that had um, way less people than it was going to end up getting. And there was a pole in front of me, and I didn't want to touch the pole because I don't like germs. So I was like, I'm going to stand next to the pole, but not grasp it with my hand. And with every stop, the car got more and more crowded, more and more crowded. It was people back to back. It, it, it was it was the closest thing to a clothed gangbang I've ever participated <laughs> in. There's little old ladies sitting, and then there's absolute strangers pressing their dick in her face hole. <laughs> and and the the it gets so crowded and the the breaks are so abrupt i finally realize i'm going to have to touch the pole but so many people had come in there was nowhere for me to put my hands anymore and that the only place to put the hand was way down below so i'm basically giving five men a clothed hand job <laughs> because there was nowhere else it's just these hand after hand it was like some weird game of jenga where everyone's hands were stacked on this pole and everybody in the car is completely blasé, just so comfortable. Like, this is their day-to-day. I'm mm-hmm. sweating. I'm hyperventilating. I've got spots in front of my eyes. I'm having trouble breathing. And uh, I, I, I don't do crowds mm-hmm. well at all. But I, I, I'm incredibly confident in front of a crowd. So when I started acquiring knowledge and education, it, it was something I was so passionate about. I wanted to share it with others. And I've, that's how I've been teaching classes for the past decade now. And my class list has actually really expanded. One of the things that I added recently that I'm super proud of is I have a, an introvert's guide to becoming kinky. It turns out that a lot of people in the lifestyle are severely introverted with social anxiety, like me. And it can be hard for them to come to a workshop in the class. And I have an entire class based around how to overcome being an introvert, overcome social anxiety, talk to other people and interact with other people. If if you wouldn't know that about me, you would think I'm a really confident person, and I am under really specific circumstances. And otherwise, I was the kid, I, I stopped getting invited to parties because when I was a teenager, I would be the kid that would come to the party and I would hang out in my host's closet and I would reorganize their clothing <laughs> To be color coordinated and their closet would look amazing by the time I was done. T-shirts here, pants here, dress shirts here. Your closet is, I mean, but it, they didn't want strangers hanging out in their closet and organizing <laughs> their clothes. I guess you were supposed to go to the party and talk to people or something. Yeah, what? The, yeah I mean, there's different ways. I'm sure some folks would appreciate having their closet neatly organized in color categories. <laughs> I, I, my friends know enough about me that when they invite me over to hang out, they know that there has to be a project. And it's mm-hmm. like, I'll be your friend. I'll come hang out. You have to say, 
come by and you can do the dishes, you can vacuum, <laughs> you, can, you can put away laundry. Uh, I had a really, um, one of my, my closest friends last year, she's like, come by and we'll do, we'll wrap presents. Wow. And you have to, you have to give me a project. If you don't give me a project, I can't relax. So my, my good true friends are like, come on by and fold my laundry. Mm-hmm. Sold. I'm there. Mm-hmm. But wait, you want me just to sit there and talk to you and not do anything with my hands. Mm -hmm. I'm incredibly grateful. Um, Roughly 10% of the human population lacks the receptors for nicotine. My father is a pack a day smoker. He's been trying to quit for 50 years. Uh, Quitting cigarettes is harder to quit than heroin, but I don't have the receptors for nicotine. I can smoke a cigarette and it does nothing for me. And I'm really grateful because I love doing things with my hands. If I had the receptors for nicotine, I'd be a pack a day easy. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I did not know that about, uh, so they they don't have the receptors mean you can't get addicted? Yeah, you can't get addicted. There's Uh whatever it is that the nicotine binds to, uh, a certain percentage of the population, and I'm lucky that I'm one of them. Mm. It's not a really large percentage, but if the nicotine goes into your brain, it doesn't have anywhere to bind into, and Uh, it just flushes through your system. Yeah, got it. And all all my friends picked up smoking was what the cool kids did. You go outside to smoke, you start your day with a cigarette, Mm. and cigarettes were expensive, they tasted bad, and they made my throat hurt. So it didn't really make sense to get addicted to those things. <laughs> okay, what's what's the point of this? I yeah. don't get it. I don't understand. So in yeah. the, so in the world, so I have a question about the world of kink. Then were you were you so would you did you identify as a kinky person before you started doing uh, oh. performing as a kink performer? Yes. Yes. Uh huh. So I find sexuality fascinating and how humans' brains are fascinating. Just how they work. It's fascinating. I'm a sex nerd. I I knew I was kinky by the age of eight. My my mother found me in front of a linen closet at midnight and she said to me rain you're supposed to be in bed what are you doing getting a pillowcase at midnight and I looked up at her with my big blue eyes eight years old and I said oh I'm getting a pillowcase to put over my head so that I can imagine that the bad men have kidnapped me oh I I was live (laughs) live action role-playing abduction fantasies at the age of eight Wow. When uh, it's and it's a truly uh, innate part of who I am. That's mm-hmm. how my brain is wired. My mother was convinced I was a genius because I could read a Nancy Drew book in one day. Now I'm a fast reader. I've always mm-hmm. been able to read fast. But the reason that I could read a Nancy Drew book in one day is I was only reading one chapter out of each book. My mother was, you know, singing my praises to the rafters. You give her a Nancy Drew book, she finishes the book in one day. Every single Nancy Drew book, every single one, all of them have one chapter where Nancy Drew is abducted by the bad men and she's tied up. Now, she always gets free, but she is a a girl detective at 15, 16, and these men keep abducting her and tying her up. And that's the only chapter I wanted to read. Nine years old, devouring Nancy Drew. (laughs) Voraciously. Book after book after book. Where's the kidnapping chapter? Then she'd get free. She would escape, and the bad men would eventually have to be held accountable for their actions. But there was certainly no kink or no BDSM. Indeed, n- no sex. When when I say you know uh, hippies, uh, we're talking religious hippies, spiritual hippies, fasting, celibacy. You know, white robes, chanting. Their uh, sex was not the focus of my parents' life. They were fairly asexual people. So where did I have such an innate desire for kink? I was born with it. I, I, it is how my brain is. I believe that people are born kinky like they're born gay you, or born transgender. You can choose not to acknowledge it. You can choose to be vanilla. You can live your entire life suppressing that part of yourself. But you're going to be miserable and mm-hmm. trying to keep your kink in the closet, it's the same thing as trying to keep being homosexual in the closet. And what often happens is that people do get married. I People write in to me all the time, and this is a really common complaint. They choose to be married, they, they choose to be vanilla, and then they realize in their 40s that they've invested 20 years in wearing a mask, and they can't, they no longer have the energy to keep that mask up. And they weren't clear with their desires. They've married a vanilla person thinking they're gonna, it's going to be okay and they can hide it. And eventually you can't hide it anymore. And you've wasted all of those years not being true to yourself. And I don't think that there's any sadder story than investing two decades and maintaining a false mask of a persona of not who you are 
when you know in your heart that's not the true version of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's I, I. So I also I am someone who I think Melrose Place was the first rape scene that I saw, and when I was probably I don't know nine or ten on TV, and was really turned on by it, and um, discovered that I had was really turned on by rape fantasies at a really young age, and. Um, and it feels so, so innate. Like there's no storyline behind that before that of where that would have come from that I can um, come to. So it just feels like it is uh, a part of me as well. And uh, I think that's important to highlight because I, you know, our listeners on the Shameless Sex Podcast, um, we definitely have some kinky folks out there or people that are curious about it. And um, I think that it's, it is, that's one of our, our, the premise of our podcast is to uh, in, educate folks so that there isn't shame around that. So I think that's an important thing to highlight that, um, that there's parts of ourselves that um, it does, I guess the story of where it came from at the end of the day might not even really matter. It's a part of you and it depends on if you want to fight it or embrace it, but there's probably a lot more joy in life if it is something that you find a way to embrace. Um, on that note, I'm going to ask you a really, really provocative question um, that I've mentioned on a podcast be- before, and this is going to be really edgy, and, and probably um, a couple listeners will be highly triggered by it, but I want to ask you about pedophilia and not your personal experience with it, but um, that that being a... Um, I'm not going to call it a kink, but it, that being some like a fe- I'm a, a, a preference, an innate mm. preference mm-hmm. yeah, that I'd... people don't have a safe outlet to um, explore. They can't even look at imagery legally. So, like, what is your belief on that? Of of I mean, for me, I I believe that we live in a kind of a shitty system that just shuns them like lepers and wants to go throw them on a, a prison cell island, and um, and that there's ways that are much better than what we're the way that we're doing it not giving everyone free reign to do whatever they want but there's like some middle ground but what is your thought on that uh interesting okay i'm I'm glad that you asked this here's the thing uh there is a zero percent if you want to do the research for this there is a zero percent cure rate for pedophilia Mm -hmm. we we do not have so when you want to unpack pedophilia what it is is really what it comes down to is power more than sex. Mm. So uh, the the people that are choosing, uh, not, not choosing, that, that feel compelled or, or driven to do pedophilia, they don't feel comfortable and confident in their own skin, and they don't feel comfortable with having a sex partner that's equal. They need to have all the power in that dynamic. And who do you have more power of over than a child? So when oh, I, I have heard men say all the time, you know, I, I like them younger because you know what, they're not as lippy and, you know, a woman gets older and she gets bitter and she gets jaded and she gets demanding. No, it's just that she's able to own her power and call you on your shit. And when you don't want to be called on your shit, when you want someone who's going to be totally acquiescent and, and that you can feel confident and comfortable and in control over, that's a child. So the the problem with having pedophilia as a wiring is not only does it have a, a 0% cure rate we're not able to cure these people they can they can suppress the desires they cannot engage in them anymore but we don't have any way to to make those desires go away once you have a pedophilia wiring you will have that for the rest of your life and we don't have a cure for it and where it becomes tricky is if that's your predilection it's one thing to say, okay, my, my kink, my wiring is that I'm, I'm really into pony play and all of my energy and I buy the props and I want to go to a ranch and I know what breed of pony I am. That's one thing. But when your predilection is for another human, they need to be consenting. And you, your, your right to, to have a wiring like that counts for a lot less when your wiring involves another human Mm -hmm. and what you do you want you don't want to exile them to an island but you don't have a right to touch someone else's body Mm -hmm. without them consenting and children cannot consent and your unfortunate predilection your wiring that you have to be a pedophile that you were born with that 
was created out of your environment. Who knows? We don't know how it it becomes created. I think a lot of it does come from shitty childhoods. I think a lot of it comes from inappropriate sexual boundaries that children are given. Uh, very, very often people that have been molested then grow up and molest. They pass the ba- damage down. So if you had perfect childhoods and no one was molested, no one had inappropriate sexual behavior happening in front of them, everyone had healthy uh, role models for sexuality and adult relationships, would pedophilia still happen? I, I don't, we don't have those controls set mm-hmm. up. But one of, the, one of the things that I don't have a lot of sympathy if it's, oh, gee, sucks for me, you know, I, I desire children and I'm oppressed because I'm not allowed to view it or I'll go to jail, I'm not allowed to touch children or I'll go to jail and be registered as a sex predator. That's not fair to me. They make they make real dolls now mm-hmm. that are ch- that are children. Yeah, they they have them. So if if your if your society says that you can't look at the imagery, you can't talk about it, you can't touch and, enjoy, and interact with other children, you know what? Save your money, scrape up the five to ten k it's going to take if your fetish is that goddamn important to you. Order off one from China, and then you can diddle all the eight year olds you want. Mm-hmm. Like, we don't we don't have that's the tool you need, and that's where your sexuality is. Your rights to your sexuality end the second they start infringing on another person's freedom. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, I love that you said that that way. That was yeah, powerful statement. <laughs> what so? What about um? I'm not gonna have the right terminology, but when it's they're doing like role play, like role playing as a baby, or like as a, is that something? Uh, uh, yeah, adult uh, adult baby role play. Adult baby, so I am. Yeah, yeah. So there's actually my friend uh, Penny Barber. She's actually written a book about it. She's I consider her an expert. Um, they're called Littles or uh, Adult Babies, and that's actually a really wide range of things. So people and I, I totally get the fetish behind it. It's not one that I'm. I have no desire to sit on a pink blanket and you know scribble in a coloring book and suck on a pacifier and and talk in a lisp. But I understand why. I totally get it. It's we are never more cared for or comforted than when we're children. Every word we say is precious. People want to play with us. You know, we're engaged with. You know, we're we're told that we're awesome. You get you're the center of attention, and you don't have to worry about bills. You don't have to worry about car payments. You don't have to worry about the insurance. You don't have to worry about the electricity getting cut off. Your food is given to you. Comfort is given to you. Toys are given to you. Attention is given to you. How is that not appealing? Growing up sucks. It's so much work being an adult that I understand the little space. Now, when people get little, where their inner child is varies wildly. Some people react, they revert down to 12 or 13. Some people go eight or nine, some people go six or five, and some people go infant and we're talking diapers. And there's a wide range of where you feel that your inner little falls to. And then once your inner little falls to a certain age range, that that's where you want to play, that's the headspace you want to be in, that's the vocabulary you want to engage in, all the way down to babies where you can't talk and you're being fed and you're in a, a giant high chair and someone's changing your diaper, then there are people that make that sexual and make it not sexual. So there are people that do littles play and they're like, my little is a five-year-old and I want to have all of the cupcakes and watch my little pony and play in the coloring books. And if I'm naughty, you know, my daddy's going to spank me, but there's no sexual energy behind it. So, and then there are people that want to get into a, a little headspace and you're playing it being four or five years old, but you're also playing being sexual. I've, I know a lot of people that do Littles Play, and I know people that do Littles Play both with a sexual content and with not a sexual content. Uh, I think that the human brain is fascinating. Mm-hmm. And even if a fetish isn't one that I myself personally engage in, I do the homework to track down why it is what it is. I had uh, Princess Kali on my podcast not too long ago, and she's written a book on erotic humiliation. And she unpacked the whole thing for me. Humiliation is not a kink of mine. It doesn't get me off. But I'm like, where's where's the, what's erotic about being humiliated? And she would explain it better than me. She teaches classes, but it was a real aha moment for a kink or a fetish that I don't participate in 
to be unpacked in a way of like, oh, okay, I see where the, the turn on is. Um, if you want to pretend to be four years old and your mommy or your daddy diddles you and th that's the role play you want to do, I can't shame people for what they do in the privacy between two consenting adults behind closed doors. No, yeah, what, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Consensual role play is yeah. is just that, and you can eat the the world is your oyster in terms of what you want to incorporate in there, right. even if it is something that's taboo or not PC. Uh, but that's your 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 consensual playground. To have the taboo aspect is often was what makes it so appealing. Mm -hmm. The the second that we're told something is forbidden, uh, I liken it to prohibition. And once prohibition was passed in America. All of a sudden, people who had never had a desire to drink alcohol in their life. Oh, the law says I can't. Now I want to drink. That's mm -hmm. how humans are wired. You can't tell us we can't do something. If we're told we can't do something, it becomes that much more intriguing. The more that you legalize something, the more that you take the shame away. Uh, Amsterdam's done that, where it's like they're decriminalizing prostitution and, and, and drugs. And they're fine. Their society is going along just fine. The more you suppress something, the more you make it taboo, the more you make it forbidden, the more people crave it, and, and the, the, the weirder and kind of ickier and funkier that craving can manifest. Mm -hmm. Will you tell our listeners then, before we wrap this up, the difference between uh, fetish and kink, if it's new to some of our listeners? Oh, yes, definitely. So the difference between fetish and kink, kink is something that's cool. Fetish is something you can't do without. Mm -hmm. So if you're a kinky person and you're like, oh, spankings are fun and I, I really like the way that people look in latex, fetish is that I, my sexuality doesn't work without that. Mm -hmm. So if someone has a foot fetish, they can become so focused on the foot fetish that the person from the ankle up becomes unnecessary. The person is just a delivery system for the feet. And they don't care who the person is attached to their feet. Their sexuality is based around the feet. Uh, here's the perfect example that I like to use. There was a, a man who was getting his house painted when he was a child. His parents were having the house painted. They weren't just having it painted. They were having it painted a, a, a peach color for one of the rooms. And whether he got his first boner, who knows what it was, his sexuality became tied in with the smell of paint. But it couldn't just be paint. It had to be that specific color. Now, I'm sure that black paint doesn't smell any different than purple paint. It smells no different than peach paint. But his sexuality was irrevocably tied to peach paint. And he couldn't fuck or masturbate or interact with someone sexually unless there was an open can of peach paint in the room. Now, imagine how inconvenient that is to have as a fetish. If you go to a bar and you pick up someone, you've got to, you can't hook up with them. You've got to have the, the paint in the back in the trunk. And then you don't ask any questions. It's going to open up the peach paint. It's going to be in there in the corner. Just, it's fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now we can fuck. That's a fetish. You can't have your sexual behavior without it. Mm -hmm. A kink is, is any sort of kinky thing that is fun to do, but it's not a deal breaker in terms of something that you can't walk away from. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I think that's very, very helpful. And then in, in the world of kink too, then in BDSM, um, will you also just highlight what that stands for to our listeners too? Since you know all the answers. <laughs> ah, I can't say that I know all the answers. Bondage, discipline, sadomasochism. And also in between there for the BDSM, not only is it bondage, discipline, sadomasochism, the DS is also dominant and submissive. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a wide range of things. Bondage is fairly common of what we think of when we think of kinky play, dominant and submissive, um, and, or sadomasochism which is both the giving and the receiving of pain. I am a sadomasochistic switch. That means I like to both top and bottom. I like to dish it out as well as take it. <laughs> I remember that from your edu your classes. <laughs> I'm I'm well rounded and slightly greedy. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm and very knowledgeable. So can you, let's see, you just taught at Pure Pleasure. You will probably, you said you'll be teaching at Pure Pleasure again in January 2019. Yes. Um, so folks want to, and that will be rope bondage once again? Yes, I'll be okay. teaching. It was a sold out class. Uh, Janice actually had to turn people away because we were filming and she wanted to limit the amount of people there. Uh, this time there'll be more spots available. Mm -hmm. So January 25th, I will be teaching my rope bondage 101 class at Pure Pleasure. I am also booked to teach at uh, 
winter wickedness in Ohio. Uh, for any of your listeners that are in Ohio, there's some I'm, in Ohio, I think. So. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm teaching a convention there, and uh, just stay tuned to my website. I get asked to present a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I'm going to be going up to Portland in a bit. So any of my classes, raindegray.com. I have a calendar with all of my upcoming events and classes. Mm-hmm. And then your podcast info. That's uh, you're on iTunes, Google Play, all the all the apps. Oh yeah, I'm on all of the places for the podcast. Let me I see. I'm. Uh, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify. Uh, I, it's I'm I'm on like eight different platforms that I'm aware of. Yeah, you're, uh, all, you're all over. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> every one of them. Mm-hmm. There's the only the only pl- I'm on YouTube now too. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, if you look me up on a podcast platform, I'll be there. And what is your podcast called? Dirty Talk with Rain to Gray. Ooh, and and yeah, I'm. Sure, it's a combination of uh, educational and very informative because, and or playful, of course. I had that one too because you are so so well spoken. Like so, I remember this from seeing you teach in in public, and it's it's funny that you're you're also saying that. Um, I guess funny is the wrong word, but you're also this like introvert who gets high anxiety around a lot of folks and. Um, and yeah, hearing you speak, I guess I, one would never make that assumption, but, um, I, yeah, I really, I really appreciate your, not only the way that you speak about sexuality, but the, the, like the length of knowledge, like the extent that you've spent educating yourself, whether it's experientially or uh, academically, there's, I can tell that you're, you know what you're talking about and it's really, really refreshing. Like your perspective, I think is um, is much needed. So I'm really glad you started a podcast to get the message out there to the masses. Oh, shucks. Thanks. Words are my favorite thing. There's so <laughs> much. Uh, and in the beginning, there was the word. Like it's the, the words are uh, almost magical mm-hmm. and they they have the power to change humanity, to topple governments, to change someone's life. I've always admired words and when they string together properly in my head, I get a huge uh, dopamine uh, release. Mm-hmm. It's a little payoff. Like for the words for me, I get a buzz off of them. Mm-hmm. So it w- that's always been something that uh, knowledge, knowledge, learning and words are my happy place. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Would you call, identify as sapiosexual? Oh yes, as <laughs> L with uh, without a doubt. Mm-hmm. I was sapiosexual before it was cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> before everyone started wearing shirts that say "I'm sapiosexual." Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Rain, and everyone. Go check out Rain at raindegray dot com. We can check out Rain's podcast, and if you watch Rain in any of um, the films that they're in, make sure that you're actually a member of a site or that you're paying for it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed the episode with the wonderful Rain DeGray. I know I did. I'm thinking I'm going to have to have her back on the show many, many times. I love a well-spoken educator. I love other podcasters, too, because they know how to talk on a microphone. (laughs) And obviously, you can tell that Rain can talk for days. Um, She is a plethora of knowledge and um, I will have her back on the show. And I also just want to put this out there. If you have requests for who we should have on our show, just as Rain did on her show, and they actually, her, some of her fans asked for me to go on her show, if there are specific educators, specific topics that you'd like, please send them to us. Uh, we did a survey a long time ago um, that I think over 500 of you answered this survey so we could get under an understanding of our demographic of who we're talking to, which is so great. It's so cool to know who we're talking to. I think having 500 of you answer really gave us a clear uh, idea of our uh, primary demographic. And you posted um, questions there and and, and um, also answered the, your, the topics that you're most interested in. Um, and something happened in the survey where I no longer can read new, like the, I think I only got to see like 200 responses and then all of a sudden it limited me on what I could see. It was very odd. It still gave me like the numbers and the percentages and statistics and I couldn't see what you actually wrote. And 
So I want to open up an invite for you to email us at shamelesssexpodcast at gmail.com or you can go onto our website at shamelesssex.com and there is under contact us, there's a little box there to send us questions. Um, And if you make the subject line pertaining to what you're sending, if you're sending a sex question, have the subject line start with sex question and um, then we'll know what it is. Or if you're sending a... um, a topic suggestion, please have the subject line say that too. So we're open to topic suggestions or also podcast referrals. If there is another speaker that you think we should have on our show, please uh, title it podcast referral or um, speaker suggestion in the topic. And we would love to um, hear your feedback because we would definitely want to speak directly to you, our beloved fans whom we love. And I know we've said this on past podcasts, but if you have not reviewed us on iTunes and you are an iTunes listener, please, please, please go and write us a review. It really helps us um, in to get out there and helps us to grow. And so the more, more reviews, the better. Um, so if you go to iTunes, if you already subscribed, you would have to unsubscribe. Or no, don't click unsubscribe. Please don't do that. We want you to be subscribed. Go search in the search box and search for um, our podcast again. And then from there, you can write a review. And if you're not subscribed, I believe you can just write a review when you look up Shameless Sex on iTunes. We love you. We appreciate you. And if you're not following us on Instagram, please do that. Um, because also on Instagram, we have contests. We just gave away a whole bunch of free products on Instagram. I think we gave away like free Hitachi or not. It's not called Hitachi anymore, but the magic wands in a Instagram giveaway. So go find the shameless sex on Instagram. Uh, I think we're going to do contests like once every two months or so, and you can win some free, free swag from us and from some wonderful sex toy companies. Uh, also, shout out to our beloved Margins Wine. We love this wine. It is woman-owned and operated, and it's also raw, raw wine made here in Santa Cruz. Raw meaning it's as organic as it gets. Um, most of the wine that you see out there, even the organic wines in the market, they have added stuff to them that, so they, because I don't believe the FDA is really regulating that, so they can put in all kinds of crazy stuff that they don't... You see, there isn't an ingredients label on wine. So it's like free reign to do whatever you want with that wine. So Margins Wine, uh, made by Megan Bell here in Santa Cruz, is raw wine. It's clean, it's organic, it's delicious. And she, she just... Every bottle I've had blows my mind. So if you love wine and um, I'm not as much of a wine snob as April is. April is a total wine snob and she loves this wine. So does my mom. And my mom is very particular about wine. So if you want to have delicious wine, wine and raw wine that's actually good for your body, go to marginswine.com. If you buy three or more and you use code SHAMELESSSEX10, you get 10% off. Or if you buy six or more, you use code SHAMELESSSEX15, uh, you get 15% off too. So definitely check this out. You will not be disappointed. Her reds are delicious. Uh, And lastly, in this month of October, which is almost over. Oh my gosh. It's in its fall. I made pumpkin pancakes this morning, by the way. It was delicious. Um, Yeah, loving fall. It's almost November. That's wild. But for uh, the month of October, if you're a lube person, meaning um, I usually don't should people, but I feel like everyone should own lube. And you should own good lube. And the reasons being, your body does not always lubricate itself. Um, There's moments when, um, based on hormones, based on stress, based on blocked glands, we might not get as much lubrication, speaking to vaginal lubrication, as um, we want or always do. And lubrication isn't always linked to arousal, meaning sometimes you can be completely aroused and not be super lubricated. Um, So having lubricant on hand is really, really handy. Uh, This also is important if you're going to use hands on genitals because hands don't lubricate themselves, obviously. And genitals are mucous membranes, meaning they like to be touched with moisture. So you take a dry hand on a mucous membrane, it feels kind of frictiony. So I suggest when you're using hands on cocks, on vulvas, on all kinds of bits, um, or the ass especially, the ass definitely will never ever lubricate itself. And if your ass does, please come to me and I would like to study your ass because you have a miracle ass. Um, but when it comes to touching these bits, uh, you want moisture. So I suggest putting lubricant on your hands when you put your hands to any of these bits, but before you touch them, um, and unless of course things are naturally just like so lubricated, but otherwise... Uh, it really, feels really good to have lubricant on your hands. So um, if you go to purepleasureshop.com for the rest of October, this is 2018. If you use coupon code OCTLUBE18, that's O-C-T, 
L-U-B-E 18 in all caps. And that's the number one eight in all caps. Uh, you get 15, oh no, 20% off, 20% off of all lubricants this month. Uh, and our listeners always get 15% off at purepleasureshop.com with coupon code shameless PP in all caps as well. I think those are all of my shout outs. We love you all. We love our fans. I miss you, April. Um, April will be back for the next recording. Um, I can't say what topic it is because I'm forgetting, but um, she will be back and we will speak to you all soon over the podcast airwaves. So much love to you all. And uh, as April would say, Ciao for now. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com.